process for giving me the opportunity to speak here. And I actually also want to thank everybody who's still here, because I know you're all really, really tired, so yeah, thank you. <laughs> so if you don't want to have a really, really painful last one hour, then you should ask a lot of questions and follow me. Okay, so I'm going to talk about Schubert's slices in the combinatorial geometry of flat domains. And uh, what I'm going to talk about today is part of my PhD thesis at the Jacobs University in Bremen, which I finished uh, two months ago or so. Okay, so, um, so I'm going to describe, uh, uh, it seems that the page of my outline doesn't work, but that's okay. <laughs> so first I want to describe the, the background of my project. And uh, that involves describing four, four geometric objects, and all these objects can be defined through theoretically. So that's what I'm going to do in the first part. And in the second part, I'm going to play around a bit with this, these objects and do some combinatorics. Okay, so if you're not that familiar with, this, with these groups, then you can just, uh, it's okay, you can just look at the pictures and then wait for the examples. Okay, so, so uh, the general setting, we start with the flag manifold Z. That means that Z is uh, the quotient of a complex semi-simple group G over a parabolic subgroup P. And in particular, P contains a boring subgroup B. And furthermore, we consider G0, G0 a real form of G. So now to give some examples, we fix some notation. So we fix the standard basis in CN, U1 in N and the standard inner product, P, so just the usual inner product, or CN, and uh, uh, the standard antilinear evolution of CN, so the complex conjugation. So this we denote by by time. Okay, so now the first example of the talk is when G is SL and C. So these are uh, complex uh, n by n matrices of the terminal equals to one. <coughs> B are the upper triangular matrices in S and C. P, the diagonal matrices in S and C. That in this case, our flag manifold is just the standard flag variety of complete flags in CN. So we have a chain of subspaces, so 0 in F1 and so on, Fn minus 1 in CN, such that the dimension of each subspace Fi equals to i. So this is kind of our first main object of study. Okay, now examples of real forms. So the way I like to think about real forms is in terms of, uh, of real structures. Namely, uh, a real form corresponds to an anti-linear uh, anti involution on, on your complex space. So in this case, if I, uh, if I give the, the real structure tau on SLNC with values in SLNC, so I just send the matrix A to its conjugate, then this is considered a, a, a real structure. And the fixed point set of such a map, it's, it's a real form. So for this map, I obtain the real form SLNR of SLNC. Okay, so for now, we have the flag manifold, we have SLNC, and the real group associated to this is SLNR. Okay, now, uh, of course, the complex group G acts transitive, transitively on the flag manifold. But this is not the case for, for the real group. And we now look at the action of, of the real group on the flag manifold and see what happens. So the first theorem uh, here is a theorem of Joe Wolf from 1969, which states that G0 has only finitely many orbits in Z. And in particular, it has open orbits, the maximal dimensional ones. So now, I don't know, how do you feel about this theorem? Do you feel like, is this possible? Is this tricky? So, you, so, so the thing about this theorem, so if you're not, if you're not familiar with the, with the structure theory of, uh, of real semi-simple algebras and uh, real semi-simple groups, then it's quite, I don't know, it's not necessarily that obvious that this is the case. So, um, so I can explain the idea of the proofs for those of you who are interested in general later on. But now let's start with a, a very simple example. So we start with P1. Okay, so P1 can be also identified with C union infinity. And in this case, we let 
SN2R act on T1. And this, we, you probably all know this, so SN2R has, has three orbits on T1, the upper half plane, the lower half plane, and the real projective space on, 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 uh, on the closure. Okay? And, and, and this is actually what kind of happens in general for SN and R in terms of open orbits. So you have up to orientation, only one open orbit actually. So you see, because in this case, kind of, you know, the upper half plane and the lower half, half plane, they are quite the same in a way. Okay, and you have a unique closed orbit. And this orbit usually sits on the boundary of, of everything else. But in general, you can have intermediate orbits as well. So in general, you kind of start with an open orbit, you go to the boundary, you find something else, you go to the boundary, you find something else, and you keep going until you go to some sort of a minimal dimensional orbit, and that's a closed orbit. But that's not obvious that you have such a closed orbit. So that's also like something that you have to prove. Okay, but for now, I mean, this is a, this is a very trivial example for what I'm going to do next, but for now, just maybe stick with this example. Okay, and then when I, when I speak about um, open orbits, you can think of the, of the upper half plane, for example. Okay, good. Now, okay, so, so, so these open orbits are, are uh, kind of like historically, they are of, of, of interest from many points of view, but one point of view <coughs> is that one looks for, for representations of, of the real league group associated to the geometry of these open orbits. So, I don't know, what kind of representations can you look for? Well, you can look, one thing you can look for is space, spaces of holomorphic functions. Okay, this, this is a complex manifold, you can look for linear spaces of holomorphic functions. Or something that has to do with cohomology, with homology, something like this. Okay, but it turns out that this open orbit, so now it's not very good to think about the upper half plane, but. <laughs> so it turns out that this open orbit, it's not the nicest space in general. So sometimes it has no holomorphic functions on it. And this such, so my, my PhD advisor actually, Anil Huckleberry, he has a paper where he describes exactly the conditions for such, such open orbits to have holomorphic functions or not on it. So then it, it turns out that it's actually better to go to another space associated to this open orbit, what's called the cycle space, and I'm going to come back to it later on. And the, but this other space, it's a, it's a very nice space. So it will be, in particular, a Stein manifold. So it will have, yeah, it will have tons of holomorphic functions. So this, is, this, this will be nice. OK. So in order to construct this space, we first start by constructing what I call the base cycle. So I'm calling this the base cycle just because, to, for you to keep it in mind, it will be a point in a bigger space. And this bigger space will be actually a smooth, a smooth manifold at this point. Uh, but, but this, uh, what will be also particularly interesting about this, uh, this subspace of the open orbit is that it is actually a deformation retract of, of your open orbit. So this little base cycle will actually encapsulate most of the properties, topological properties of your open orbit. Except that this one will be compact and your open orbit is not. But Okay, so but let's see the, the, the second theorem. So this is also a theorem of Joe Wolf. And it says that if D is an open G0 orbit in, in Z, then K0, so K0 is a choice of a maximal compact subgroup of, of G0, has a unique orbit in D, which we denote by C0, which is a compact complex algebraic submanifold of D. Okay? So, so you see, so now we fix an open orbit. So I'm going to have a couple of pictures and review these theorems again later on. But okay, maybe this theorem is also not very obvious. I mean, okay, I guess this guy even got famous for nothing. So, yeah. <laughs> but uh, yeah, I'm going to to come with some examples. So, so you're going to see it better. But for now, just, just so now fi fix this open orbit, and inside this open orbit, we can think we 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 let the the maximal compact subgroup act as well. And then it turns out that only one of these orbits is actually a, a compact complex subnet. And this is actually the main object of study, and I'm calling it the, the base cycle. So now, oh, okay, now I just want to, before I give an example, I want to say that in the same way that I'm choosing uh, real forms as fixed point sets of real structures, I also have a, a nice way to choose uh, 
maximal compact subgroups as fixed full sets of what's called the Cartan involution. And then in the case of SLNR, this is just A maps to A minus transpose, and its fixed point sets are just special orthogonal group. Okay, so for now, uh, for as, as examples, so we think SLNC, then we think SLNR acting on the set of full flags, we, we pick an open orbit, and now we look at SONR acting on this open orbit, and we see that it has only one, uh, one orbit, that's a compact complex submanifold. Uh, okay, so now in, in our, our little example with, with P1, if uh, SO2R acts on the upper half plane, it has uh, uh, this, this base cycle here, it's quite trivial, it's just a point, it's just the complex number I. And on the lower half plane, again, it's symmetric, it's the complex number minus I. So here in this example, our main object of study is pretty trivial. <laughs> so, but later on, when, uh, when I'm going to start talking about my own results, then I'm going to, to describe this, uh, this base cycle in full generality. Okay, well, this is still nice to, to think about it. So, so, this, so this theorem, I don't know if you, uh, are you guys familiar with this phenomenon called the Matsuki duality? Okay, so, so this is also, <laughs> So this comes also, it, it's quite, a, quite a, an important uh, phenomenon in representation theory. And, uh, and it just says that the open G0 orbits are in one-to-one -one correspondence, no, all the orbits, actually, I'm sorry. So all the G0 orbits are in one-to-one -one correspondence with K orbits, where K is the complexification of K0. So, so in a way, you can, you can kind of forget about the real part and just talk over the complex numbers if you think about this. Okay, anyhow. Okay, so um, one of the main methods for studying the situation involves the use of Schubert varieties, which are somehow dual to this, to this base cycle in a way that I'm going to make precise in a second. And the key to this is the Yosa decomposition of a semi-simple group. And I'm going to come back to this as well. Okay, so now, Let's, uh, let's just review some small things about Schubert varieties. So for a fixed Borel subgroup B of G, a B orbit O in Z is called a Schubert cell. And the closure of such a, such a Schubert cell is called a Schubert variety. And it is a basic fact that the integral homology ring of, of the flag manifold is a freezing module generated by the set of Schubert varieties. Okay, now in the case of S and C, um, actually in general, the Schubert varieties are, are parameterized by elements of the wild group of G. But in the case of S and C, we can actually identify this wild group with a symmetric, a symmetric group uh, on N level. And uh, the notation that we are going to use this for this is the one line notation. So W equals W1 and so on until WN. It just means the bijection that sends I to WI. But you already used this in all the other talks where the symmetric group appeared. So, so with this one, you're familiar. <laughs> OK. So, um, Okay, so just keep in mind that if you're not familiar with, with Schubert varieties, just keep in mind that there are again some geometric objects that can be group theoretically defined and that are parameterized by the symmetric group in this case. Uh, okay, now the Iwasawa decomposition. So, so why? So you see, we, we, here we work with with, with uh, real structure, with complex structures, and we somehow play around with both of them. And uh, okay, and see what we got. Yes, but um, these Borel subgroups they are defined uh, over the complex numbers, so they are not defined over the real numbers here. So, but I want to kind of find a Borel subgroup that, in a way, is as real as possible. So, kind of that aligns perfectly with, with my real structure. And for this, I use uh, I use this Iwasawa decomposition. So this is a global decomposition which decomposes your group as a product of K0, A0, and N0, where, um, okay, I didn't, I didn't write it down, but, but this K0 is your maximal compact subgroup. 
So this K0 is just S O and R, let's say, as an example. And A0 and N0 are its own solvable group. So this, everybody saw this in their linear algebra course, because in the case of S L and R, this is just the Gram Schmidt orthogonalization process. <coughs> okay? So you so so I'm assume, assuming you are familiar with that. So you, you see so you can you can decompose S L N R as a product of um, S O two N R uh, or S O N R and uh, and this will be just the upper upper triangular matrices. Okay, so I'm using this to define this special Borel subgroup, which in a sense is uh, is uh, as real as possible. So a Borel subgroup B I such that B I contains a Iwasawa component A not and not is called an Iwasawa Borel subgroup, and uh, the closure of the, uh, of the BI orbit is called the Iwasawa Schubert variety. Okay, and then we denote by S C not the set of Iwasawa Schubert varieties that satisfy the dimension of S plus the dimension of C not equals the dimension of the open orbit. So together they add up to the full dimension of the flag manifold, and. Uh, and sure varieties that have non-empty intersection with your base circle. Okay, good. So, so the theorem that was uh, the basis for my for my uh, PhD project is a theorem of Alan Hartleberry from 2002, which says that if you have such a Schubert variety, such an Iwasawa Schubert variety, so you kind of picked it up cleverly by picking up this this clever Borel. And its dimension plus the dimension of the cycle add up to the full dimension, and it has non empty intersection with the base cycle, then the following code. So S intersects C naught in only finitely many points, Z1 until ZPS. The orbits of these Ziwasawa components A0 and not at these points of intersection are open in S and closed in P. And the intersection at, at, uh, at each of these points is transversal. So uh, here is the picture of the theorem. So uh, yeah, so again, we let this real group act, we obtain an open orbit. Here it's D, so the whole, I don't know, gray could think that's the open orbit, yeah? Inside the open orbit, we look at this compact submanifold, which here is drawn with blue, so C naught. Then somebody comes up with a clever idea. He's like, okay, let me choose these nice Schubert varieties and intersect, um, intersect my manifold with them. Then it turns out that the intersection happens in finitely many points. So in this case, Z1, Z2, Z3, Z4. Moreover, the intersection happens inside the, the, the Schubert cell. So you actually have no singularities inside your open orbit, which is great because you can just work with the Schubert cell if you, if you want to. And, uh, and this, uh, uh, the orbits of A0 and N0 at these po uh, points of intersection are actually disjoint. So it's exactly how it is in this picture. So, yes? Sorry, can you, uh, now that we are uh, looking at the picture, can you recall what these things are in the case uh, SL uh, and like? Yes, 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 yes. Like so I'm going to, so I'm going to come uh, yeah. uh, the next. I'm going to discuss the SL in that case, and I'm going to, to recall okay. everything. So, uh, but I can also say, say it now, and then say it later on as well. So, in the case of SL and R, uh, I still did not describe your open orbit, but that I will do later on. Uh, so, okay, it's actually better to just go on and describe with the with the whole things in terms of flags. Uh, okay, but now the main question of the PhD project was to describe precisely which Iwasawa Schubert varieties have non empty intersection with C0 and in how many points do they intersect and, of course, count them and so on. And this in particular will give the, will describe the location of C0 in the homology ring of the, of the flag manifold. Okay, so now uh, I, I solved the problem from, for SL and C. Where up to conjugation, G0 belongs to one of the three types. So you have SLMR, <coughs> SPQ, and SLMH. So uh, I'm going to discuss about the, the first two uh, today. And uh, yes, so um, 
What's H? Yes, so that's, um, uh, that's, I'm not going to discuss it today, so it's okay. <laughs> Yeah, okay, because I, I guess I will not have enough time anyway. So just think of S and R and SUPQ, but th those are the quaternions. Okay. Yeah. Okay, so now let's start now and uh, redefine uh, all these objects in terms of S and R. Okay, so, um, so here BI is just the standard Borel of upper triangular matrices. Okay, so you know, so my, my clever Borel here is actually not that clever because it's just the upper triangular matrices. Because here I don't really run into too much problem because when I do QR decomposition, I see that my, uh, my complex structure perfectly aligns with the, with the real structure. So here you can just think of the upper triangular matrices. Um, then we have a geometric description of the open orbit and the base cycle in terms of flags. So now let's see. So the, um, the open orbit is the set of flags such that the dimension of tau, so tau is complex conjugation, Tau Fi intersection Fj is the maximum in between 0 and i plus j minus n. And this just means that Tau Fi and Fj are in general position for all ij. Okay, so you have this set of cool flags. So I'm just discussing G mod B here, but okay, I solved the problem for G mod B as well, but that will take a bit too much time to, to explain. So just think about full flags, and for example, you can, you can think about, so what does this mean? This means that the conjugate of F1, direct sum Fn minus 1, it's the whole space, it's Cn, and so on. Okay, this, these flags are called <coughs> tau generic flags. And C0 is just a set of uh, isotropic flags, where now we take uh, uh, the orthogonal complement we take with respect to the standard unit product in CN. So these are flags such that either Fi is included in the orthogonal complement of Fj, or the orthogonal complement of Fi is included in Fj. Okay? Okay. So, um, so okay, so now, I will start with combinatorics, so it's okay, you don't need to think about any more about this. <laughs> no, so what was my idea? So my idea was like this. My idea was to find for each description that we have here, for these tau generic flags and isotropic flags, to find an equivalent condition on vibe group elements, so on the symmetric group. Because the, this, this symmetric group is parametrizing, uh, parametrizing my, uh, my Schubert varieties. So I want to find out which Schubert varieties intersect my base cycle, which nice Schubert varieties. So I want to find out which of these nice Schubert varieties have these geometric objects and, and try to explain this, uh, this geometric condition just in, in terms of the combinatorics of the wild group that, that parameterizes these Schubert varieties. Okay, so the first condition says that a permutation, so now we use the, the one line notation, W equals K1 until Km, L star and then Lm until L1. So observe that I'm, I'm kind of dividing my permutation into two symmetric parts, in case I have um, uh, even, N is even, and in case it's odd, I have one element in the middle. And I'm comparing uh, the first element on the left with the first element on the right, second element on the left with the second element on the right, and so on. So I kind of go from these directions and come to the middle. And then I say that this permutation satisfies the spacing condition if Li is smaller than Ki. Okay, so, so as an example, 2, 6, 5, 4, 3, 1 satisfies the spacing condition because one is smaller than two, and three is smaller than six, <laughs> and so on. So this is this is an example of such a permutation. <coughs> but this one does not satisfy the spacing condition because four is not smaller than two. Okay. The second condition I call the double box contraction condition. This I will just explain in an, in an example. So we we take the ordered set one until n. In this, take, I, in this case, I take 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6. 
and at, it, at each step I'm picking up a, a, a pair of consecutive elements. So they don't necessarily need to be consecutive numbers, but they need to sit near each other in this ordered set. Of course, at the, at, at the first step, there will be consecutive numbers. So I pick up three and, uh, four and five, and then I replace K1 with the bigger number, and then L1 with the smaller number. Then I remove four and five from this uh, representation, and I make a contraction to bring this set together, and now I repeat, I do the same. So I choose another pair. So now what could I choose? I could choose three and six as well, because they sit together, or I could choose one and two, or two and three. And I choose to choose two and three, and then again I'm replacing K2 with three, and uh, L2 with two. I remove them from the representation, I make a contraction, and I'm left with one and six. <coughs> And now I place this in the, in the obvious way, and I get a permutation that satisfies this double box contraction condition. OK, uh, do you have any questions about these two conditions? They are really simple, no? It was not that simple for me to get them, but <laughs> they are quite simple. Um, this, uh, this condition can be formulated uh, for any, like, uh, binary group. No? Can, can, I mean, can, can you it's a, it's a condition for SN. Yeah, but I mean, can, can they can be generalized? Uh. Yeah. So okay. So what I did for okay. So for my yeah. PhD thesis, I only oh, I, I just worked with type A, so I just worked with SN. Okay, but, but just I'm hoping that they can be yes. Okay. So there is somebody else, maybe another PhD student or somebody who will who will maybe take this this work um, later. Yes. If you construct it this way, don't you automatically satisfy the first condition? Yeah, exactly. Yeah, that's a very good point. Yay. Somebody understood what I said. <laughs> <laughs> yes, exactly. So double box contraction implies the spacing condition, but not the other way around. Yes? <coughs> so because, uh, yeah, not the other way around, exactly. Okay, so, so, but the idea, so why I did like this? Because, so, so now you, you will see like in my, in my first result, so my first result says that the Schubert variety corresponding to a, to a Y element, W, has non-empty intersection with C0 if and only if W satisfies the spacing condition. So this is the first condition. So this condition just tells me which Schubert varieties intersect the base cycle, but it doesn't tell me what dimension they have. So they can actually, yeah, they, they can have bigger dimensions. So I'm looking, so I'm looking for special ones. I'm looking for the minimal dimensional ones. So the ones that their dimension plus the dimension of the base cycle add up to the full dimension. But first, I search for a condition that told me uh, which super varieties intersect, and then among those, I looked. Okay, let's see now which ones have the right dimension. The, and that was kind of. Uh, I mean, the reason why I kind of did it like this just because uh, that's how I could prove. <laughs> that's how I could prove the next, the next result. So I needed to prove this proposition first, and then, um, okay, then I wanted to give the idea of proof. I can actually skip this. And then the main result stated that the super variety has the right dimension as well, if and only if W satisfies the double box contraction condition. Okay. So what we did actually, uh, so yeah, so I just wanted to say that what we constructed before now parameterizes a good super variety. So what I did was to find the one-to-one -one correspondence in between geometry and combinatorics. So the tau generic condition on flags corresponds to the spacing condition on elements of the Weyl group. So this was the condition that gave me the open orbit. And the isotropic condition on flags corresponds to the double box contraction condition on elements of the pi group. And this is the condition that gives me the base cycle. Okay. And, uh, okay, so now a corollary of this states that the number of Schubert varieties, it's a very well known number, it's just double factorial. So, okay, th this was very surprising because 
it seems it doesn't depend on anything except of uh, n, so on Cn. And actually, I just want to say that I'm not discussing G mod P here, but in the case of G mod P, it will depend on the dimension sequence that defines your parabolic. And it will be a similar formula, but it will depend on that, uh, yeah, on the dimension of sequence. So in a way, you could say that this depends on the dimension sequence that defines your Borel, but your Borel subgroup is just one, 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 so you end up with the end of the double factor. Okay, now the next problem was to find out the number of intersection points and to describe them precisely in terms of flags. And it turns out, I and mean, this was really, really surprising, actually the number of intersection points does not depend on the sugar variety that intersects the base cycle. And in each case, it's 2 to the power of m if the space was odd dimensional, so if m was 2m plus 1. And it is 2 to the power of m minus 1 if the space was even dimensional. So, uh, yeah, so this is again quite simple, and it, uh, you will see later on when, when we discuss SCP2 how, how this is a bit in a bigger context. <coughs> okay, and the points are given explicitly and can, and can be read from the value group element. So, you give me a value group element that parameterizes a good Schubert variety, then I can tell you exactly the points of intersection. And those are given by this formula, so you just have plus minus I E L1 plus E K1. So remember our, our, uh, yeah, our value if it's written like this, so let's say K1, K2, L2, L1. So you can just read from here. And this uh, E L1, so this is just the standard basis. So the points are again quite easy to, to write down. Okay, so as a consequence, we, we, we can describe the fundamental class of the base cycle. So the fundamental class of the base cycle, you can just sum over this, this Iwasawa super varieties uh, with the multiplicity ds. So ds is just the number of the points of intersection. But because the number of the points of intersection did not depend on the Schubert variety, then we have a very, very nice formula. So it's just 2 to the power of m summing over the Schubert varieties that I described in the odd dimensional case, and even we just have 2 to the power of m minus 1. Okay, do you have any questions until now? Is the degree come out nicely? Degree with respect to upper and bend? Some of the degrees of the Sorry. Does the degree of the base cycle come out nicely if you sum up the degrees of these sugar varieties? I'm not sure. But maybe I should write it down and see if there's a connection. Okay. Okay, then we go to, to SUPQ now. So uh, SUPQ is the group of isometries associated to the standard Hermitian form of signature PQ, where P plus Q equals L. So now here, here it's actually not that nice as before. So even though you will see like the, the open orbit and the base cycle have really easy descriptions in terms of flags, the combinatorics gets really complicated for, for a reason that you'll see in a moment. And the reason is actually that you have many, many, many open orbits. So in the case of SLNR, we had one or two open orbits. And even when we had two open orbits, these open orbits were symmetric. So if a Schubert variety was intersecting one of them, it was intersecting the other one as well. So you could just reduce yourself to the study of one open orbit. But here you have many. And uh, the open orbits here are parameterized by, um, by sequence of numbers A and B where A goes, it's an increasing sequence, so not strictly increasing, but just increasing, and A goes until Q, B goes until P, such that AI plus BI equals I. And then the open orbit will be the set of flags such that the signature of FI is AIBI at each, at each point. So here the open orbits are parameterized by signature. 
And if you are familiar with another theorem from linear algebra, which is a uh, uh, bit theorem, bit theorem. <laughs> maybe I don't pronounce his name well, but this is exactly his theorem. Because, so, so this is another example of, of uh, where you can see this theorem with that G0 has only finitely many orbits, only from linear algebra. Because that theorem says, okay, you can clearly have an isometry with, between two flags that have the same signature. And that theorem just says that you can extend this isometry to the full group for two space. Yes. Okay, so now that, that's quite nice, but for me, to, for, for the combinatorics of this situation, it was better to work with the sequence of numbers. So I'm parameterized with open orbits either by a sequence of zero and ones or by a sequence of minus and pluses. So zero you have Q zeros, you have P ones, and of course zero corresponds to negative signature and one corresponds to positive signature. And then you can immediately see now that the number of open orbits is uh, n choose Q. So you have quite a lot of open orbits. And maybe, so maybe I just give an example here. So let's say we take S for two, and we will take A and B to be let's say one, so this is P and this is Q. And then A corresponds to negative, B corresponds to positive. And then let's say we take like this. Um, okay, so this just tells me that F1 contains, uh, is spanned by a negative vector. Then when you go to F2, F2 has a basis composed from one negative vector, one positive vector. You go to F3, F3 has a basis composed from vectors two negative and one positive and so on. And the way I'm constructing this sequence of zeros and one, for negative I put minus, now I see that positive increases, I will put the plus, the negative increase I will put the minus, and then I have uh, plus, plus, and plus. Is this clear? Okay. Um, okay, so now we fix an open orbit DAB, and now I want to, I want to give similar conditions for the base cycle. So let E minus be spanned by um, the first Q elements of the standard basis and E plus by the last P elements. So you see, so I'm taking the vectors, uh, negative vectors and then first Q negative vectors and then positive vectors. Then the base cycle is the set of flags that has perfect intersection with this E minus and E plus. So in the sense that the dimension of fj intersection E minus is aj, and the dimension of fj intersection E plus is bj. So, for example, if I'm looking at f1, again in this su for 2, so, so I couldn't have that f1 is spanned by, let's say, by E1 plus E4, because this is an isotropic vector. But on the other hand, I could have f1 to be spanned by E1 because E1 has uh, a negative signature. Okay, so the idea is that this, this base cycle doesn't contain, uh, you could say that it uh, doesn't contain isotropic vectors. So you want to, at each point, you want to have either positive signature, negative signature, but you don't want to have uh, zero signature. Okay, now, uh, now here it was a bit more difficult to, to find this convenient iwasawa Borel subgroup. And, uh, and the way to do it, let me think. Okay, so I'll just try to show you an example because this also has to do something with the structure theory of real, uh, real algebras and big groups and I'm not sure if you're a bit familiar with this. So, so for SU42, I'm taking the following flag. So I'm taking E1 plus uh, E4. So you see I go E1 plus E2Q. 
So in this case, I do 4. Then I go uh, e2 plus e3. Then I'm left with e5 and 6. And then I go e2 minus e3 and um, e1 minus e4. So you, you kind of see the symmetry. So e1 plus e4, at the end it's e1 minus e4. So the conjugate in a way. So e2 minus e3 uh, plus e3, then e2 minus e3, and then it's um, kind of like the three vectors that are left. So I'm kind of pairing, you know, one negative with one positive, one negative with one positive, and then I have two positive vectors left over. And of course there is a reason to do this. The, the thing is that the, the, these torus and these borels are grouped with perfectly aligned with my real structure, but that you can only see if you actually do the Iwasar decomposition for SUPQ. So if you work with restricted groups. But I'm not sure if you... Is anybody having familiarity with this? Not really, so then I just skip. <laughs> okay, so, but this is the kind of flag that I'm using. And then, you, so recall that when, when you talk that the value group is, the value group is the symmetric group. I mean, this is a bit, not necessarily the, the, the perfect way to say it. I mean, because what you have in the back of your mind is that you actually choose a torus, then you have the value group of this group with respect to the torus, and then with respect to some basis in this case. So when at the, in the SNNR case, I, I chose the isomorphism with SN to be given by the standard torus of diagonal matrices and the standard basis E1 until Pn. Now I'm going to choose the isomorphism to, to be given with respect to this torus and this basis. So I'm kind of working with two by groups. But of course, this, in the end, they are both the symmetric group and there is an isomorphism to go from one to the other. Okay, so then we choose this to be the stabilizer, the USR borel to just be the stabilizer of this flag. Okay, so now I want to give again equivalent conditions to my uh, conditions on flags on permutation. So the first condition is the pairing condition, and this says that a permutation satisfies the pairing condition if the number n minus i plus one stays at the left of the number i, for all one smaller equal i smaller equal to q in the one line notation of the permutation. And uh, the order of the other numbers doesn't count. So what does this mean? So you see? So I said that I'm choosing this to be to give me the isomorphism to the symmetric group. So this means that this <coughs> corresponds to the identity permutation. So one, two, three, four, five, and six. Okay, so this is the identity permutation. And now this condition says that. 6 sits before 1, 5 six be sits before 2, and the other numbers don't count. And the reason why I want six, 6 to sit before 1 is that when I take the B orbit of this flag, you see, if 1 sits before 6, for example, then, then in, inside the B orbit, I'll just have this, this vector. But this vector is isotropic. It doesn't sit in my base cycle. But then if, if this one will come before, then I kind of get a chance to, to split the degeneracy. Because, so, you see E1 minus E4, and E1 plus E4, the span of this is just the span of E1 E4. And now I actually split it, the degeneracy. Okay, so, um, yeah, this was the kind of the geometric explanation behind it. So I give this explanation here. So I say that 6, 5, 4, 3, 1, 2 satisfies the pairing condition. Yeah, 6 sits before 1, 5 six, sits before 2, and then 4 and 3 I don't really care. Okay, now let's see. Now the strictly pairing condition, this I will just explain again in an example. So here I'm having these pairs. So I'm having for SU42, I, I pair 6 and 1. I pair 5 with 2. And 3 and 4 are the leftover numbers. And the algorithm goes that you have to place these pairs exactly in this order. So you need to start with 6 and 1. When you place 6 and 1, you need to place 5 and 2. And then you need to place 3 and 4. And uh, 
Uh, and the way to do this is kind of like a converse of, of what I did for S and R. So you need to play 6 and 1 as close as possible to each other. So I just pick them and I put them in boxes near each other. Then I go to the next pair. I have 5-2. Five, 5-2 two. Five, two also I have to place as close as possible to each other, but I can ignore what I placed before. So I could place them in the first two boxes, the last two boxes, but I, could, I can also place them like hugging six and one. Okay, so they need to sit as close as possible to each other, but at each step I can ignore what I placed already before. Okay, and then three and four, I place them in consecutive order in the boxes that are left. Okay, do you have some questions about this algorithm? Okay, so uh, now, now, okay, now things, things get complicated here just because I have so many orbits. So in a way, you, you wouldn't expect one algorithm to just give you everything <coughs> for every orbit because every orbit is really different. So, so first I said, okay, first I looked at the Schubert varieties which intersect at least one open orbit. And I said that the condition for, for a Schubert variety to intersect at least one, one open orbit is, um, is this pairing condition. Then, um, let's see. Okay, then I construct this cycle that where, where I'm summing over all the cycles in all the orbits. So you see, in, in, in each of these many, many orbits, I have, uh, I have a cycle. I have this this compact uh, submanifold. And then I look at the object that sums over all these compact submanifolds. So, and then first I'm going to describe this one, its homology, and then I'm going to describe the homology of, it, of the separate components. Okay, so the first result says that, <coughs> of course, such a super variety intersects uh, at least one base cycle and it has the right dimension if we have this strictly pairing condition, but if it intersects one of them, it actually intersects two to the power of Q. And, and it's exactly like, like this picture. So, so again, the number of base cycles that it intersects, it does not depend on, um, on anything, just P and Q. And then you can kind of imagine them as a stack, so you have many, many orbits, and then this sugar variety comes and just kind of like pierces each one of them in precisely one point, goes out, and so on. Okay, and the number actually yeah, depends only on Q. There is only one point of intersection in each base cycle, and you can actually read from the while group element which open orbit it intersects, which base cycle it intersects, and you can also read the points of intersection. And now what do you observe about these points? that they are really just a standard basis. They are points just, you know, the usual standard basis in CN. So they are actually fixed points of the initial torus of diagonal matrices. So you see, so by, in, in this case, I'm in, uh, I'm in C10. So E10 means the point with coordinate 0, 0, 0, 0, and 1 on the 10th place. So this was, this was again like really, really surprising because now, now I'm working with another torus that a priori has nothing to do with this torus, but then it turns out that the points of intersection are just fixed points of the, of the initial torus. Okay, so uh, until, uh, until now still I had no problems with the combinatorics, but it's coming, my problem <coughs> is coming soon because so, okay, so I compute the cardinality of all these things, so I get something that's like the double factorial, but now it depends on Q. So if Q would, equal, would be equal to P, then it would be the same as the double factorial in the SLNR case. And then I compute the, the homology class of this cycle that's just the sum over, over all the other cycles. But now what I actually wanted, so I wanted so you see, here I started with the super varieties and I told you what it intersected, but that was not my initial problem. My initial problem was I start with an open orbit, a random open orbit among the many ones, 
tell me which super varieties intersect this open orbit. Okay, and then these are um, these are given by the following algorithm. So in this case, I give you an open orbit. I give you the orbit that's parameterized by plus plus minus plus plus minus, and then this algorithm constructs you. Uh, in the same time, it constructs the super variety that uh, intersects it and the point in which it intersects it. <coughs> and the way to do it is by, um, so here you cannot really see that much, but again you kind of repeat the same algorithm. So here you have E1 and E4, the pairs E2 and E3, and E5 and E6. So now I'm actually working with the vectors because it was kind of easy. So then, and I replace a, a plus no, a minus with e either E1 or E2, so a negative vector, a plus, I will replace it with a positive vector, and I'm replacing these pairs in, in the order that they are given. So at the first, I replace, I choose E1 and E4, I construct my point, and I construct the corresponding value of element. So you see here it's quite obvious that I actually worked with two, two, two Dori. Then I take E2 and E3. Again, I, I place them as close as possible. So I choose to place them there. And then I'm left with E5 and E6, and I place them in consecutive order. OK. So here I constructed you the point of intersection and the super variety that intersect with that point. Mm -hmm. OK, so now we have, again, a very, very simple formula just because each such super variety will intersect in only one point. So you're just summing over all these super varieties that, that are given. And uh, here I wanted to give an example about maximal parabolics. So when P is a maximal parabolic <coughs> and your flag manifold is a Grassmannian, here I can actually compute everything very easy, but I, I won't do that anymore because I have not that much time. So I want to explain you what was the problem in counting, because maybe somebody here among you who are experts in counting can give me some ideas. So, so let's just go back to Okay, so, so I, I look at all the open orbits for SU42. So you see here I have, I have many orbits. So one orbit is the one that I wrote there. So it's plus, plus, minus, plus, plus, minus. But I could also have minus, minus, plus, 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 and so on. So the problem that, that I have in counting the sugar varieties uh, is that, so like, so how to say it? So, so if, you, if you give me a specific orbit, then I can actually count, run the algorithm and count. And then I can, found, I can find that there are orbits that get intersecting only, only by one Schubert variety, like this one. Or I can find orbits that get intersected by what I call a maximal number of Schubert varieties. But then in the middle, they will get intersected by all sorts of, of, of crazy uh, crazy numbers, and I, I found no way to kind of like somehow inductively to move or something like that to actually compute, to give a formula for this number. Because, so here I, I so I have this pair, so I have E4, E1, E2, E3, and E5, and E6. So as like, as a, as a background structure, I'm just having these brackets which are quite well known in combinatorics. So I kind of have to find in how many ways I can, uh, I can, have, uh, I can close these parentheses. So if I have an open parenthesis, then I want to close it as well. So something like this. So this is kind of the background problem. And here, here it will look like this, 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 and then the other ones will be just that over. And this, this, something like this you can count. It's, uh, it's just like Catalan numbers, something with Catalan numbers. But now I want to say, okay, given this, 
I, I also I want to say in how many ways can I place these numbers on such a structure? Because here I could do like this. I could place like E1, E4, uh, E, uh, E3, E2, and then I would place E5 and E6. But these ones I could also place uh, E4, E1, E2, E3, and E5 and E6. And then for this one it will be a different <coughs> problem. So. <coughs> yeah, so my problem was, okay, give me this, this random structure, how can I, uh, how can I count in how many ways I can place this, this pairs using this rule. Okay, yeah, that's it. So if you have any ideas, let me know. And otherwise, thank you. So, uh, are there comments or questions for Ana Maria? Well, if not, I'll enter again. <laughs> <laughs>